calling the uh, Ad Hoc Affordable Housing Committee to order. Um, and we have one item before us, which is resolution RS 2019-58, sponsors Mendez, Hauser, and others. And I would invite anyone on the committee to sign it if you are so inclined. Um, this approves an amendment one to a grant contract for constructing affordable housing. Can you speak just a little bit louder? Yes. This approves uh, a grant contract for constructing affordable housing approved by RS 2017-965 between the Metro Housing Trust Fund Commission and Mending Hearts. And I have a letter from the sponsor as well as the sponsor. So is there a motion? So moved. Great. Any discussion? <clears throat> we have Hannah Davis from the mayor's office to uh, answer any questions we have about this. So I would just, can you just yes. tell us a little bit about Mending Hearts? I was hoping that we would get great. a chance. They, Mending Hearts does great work. They are expanding their capacity for residential treatment for women coming out of uh, addiction. And they have a number of units up in the um, Charlotte Ave area. They do great work, low recidivism rate, and the product that they've been building is beautiful. They've done a great job being intentional with a diverse group of subcontractors, some who are just building their uh, business, so it's great to see Barnes money going to that as well. They are on track to be completed. They just submitted their fifth draw, fourth draw request out of five, but they'll need about three more months to get all of the final paperwork, the CO, um, and the inspection. So it's on track for completion. And just for your reference point, all of the grants are overseen by the Housing Commission as well, which is a public commission. And there's a clawback provision within Barnes that if any of the projects were not proceeding on schedule, then um, there's the option to claw back any previous awards. So we keep a close eye to see, A, if we can be of service and helping expedite the product projects at all. Um, and then secondly, to see if there were to be any um, fraud or anything where a project sort of got forgotten that those funds are um, able to be accounted for so it's not unusual for a contract to need three months past the 24 months that's standard with metro contracts and that's the case here so that's what the amendment is yes it's just to extend an extension the time mm -hmm. to do that other other questions but a great benefit to district 21 I will say that oh that's so good to hear mm -hmm. I'll be happy to hear that any, any other questions or comments? Okay, it's been moved and seconded and discussed. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? It was recommended and that means one. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Eight for, not against. All right, that is recommended and that ends our um, legislative agenda. Um, but I have asked uh, representatives from MDHA to come um, and Further, my goal of getting this committee educated on uh, what is out there in Nashville in terms of providing housing affordability for people who um, are of low income. So this week, we have um, Jim Harbison and Matt Wilcher from MDHA. And then also, just because I meant to do introductions before everybody left the room, um, Judith, if you want to introduce yourself real quick. Uh, uh, and here's Sandra. Sorry. Um, I don't know if you're going to speak, but I want you to get introduced before. I'm Judy Tech and I'm the director of the Homeless Impact Division. I'm actually here to learn alongside you because I think the homeless conversation, we're, we're working at the Homeless Impact Division to help people that are extremely vulnerable access housing. So at this point in the, in the community, the homelessness conversation and the affordable housing conversation have been a little bit separated and we've been working very hard to actually really Connect. Great. We appreciate that. Judy's been working very hard. Yeah. <laughs> We've been along for the conversation. That's right. Uh, lots of conversation, I'm sure they're sure. So I would love to uh, to turn it over to y'all. And I know if some of y'all have to scoot out, please do scoot out. But, um, you know, if y'all can give us half an hour's worth of, of education, I don't know what you plan, but um, or give us whatever you plan and we'll ask questions. And, um, so, and then. Next next month, um, we're going to be hearing from stakeholders like Open Table and NOAA, so um, that'll be our education piece. So, that'll be, thank you very much. Sure, well, just for my education, how many people made the breakfast? I know several people are okay. And how many people, I know we've had a one on one, and how many people Matt has a chance to talk to? In addition, okay, so, uh, so I'll offer this. Matt's specifically here to be your conduit for all questions, anything you need. If you can't get hold of me, get hold of Matt. 
Uh, for those of you that made the breakfast and have seen Matt's presentation, I'll apologize in advance. There's going to be some redundancy, but I'm going to try to drill through. There's a lot of a good number of slides, but they'll go pretty quick and then take your questions. So I think we do this in about 20 minutes, just go through sort of a once over the world in DHA. So Metropolitan Development Housing Agency formed in 1937, charged as the Metropolitan Development Housing Agency in the 60s when you put Metro together and you brought in the development piece and the housing piece together, which is unusual. So our mission though is to do two things, uh, grow the affordable housing stock in Nashville, provide opportunity and develop uh, the city when you're called upon by you in the city or and also in the community development funds that we manage each year. It goes in four big buckets on page two. Um, we'll start with the smallest urban development, which handles the low-income housing tax credit pilots. That's a very successful program started uh, under the previous council's watch. Um, we've got something on the order of 800 units uh, built under that program, and essentially uh, the state of Tennessee is the only state in, the, in America, the United States, that taxes the value of a low-income housing tax credit. A low-income housing tax credit is a federal tax credit the state of Tennessee administers, gives it to a developer, who then goes and sells it to Coca-Cola GM. Uh, so you've got a dollar tax credit, you'll sell it for 90 cents or 95 cents, and they give you a check. Use that check to build housing with. In this case, that check value in the state of Tennessee is taxed. Everywhere else in the country it's not. So your payment in lieu of taxes forgives that, uh, forgives that taxable requirement that the property assessor has to give and uh, make sure that these projects pencil. And so there's a lot of success stories out there for that. It's our smallest department. Um, and really handles the pilots and uh, the redevelopment districts. Over to community development, the left-hand corner, we manage uh, 9.2 million of community development grants, uh, home funds, housing for people of AIDS, emergency solution grants. It's an alphabet soup. Uh, there's a whole separate presentation I gave at uh, the breakfast uh, on what they do. Um, but this is key to developing the city and to providing grants to largely the nonprofit community for new, new affordable housing. As an example, the Jefferson Street Pocket Park that's under construction on Jefferson Street is one of the community development projects funded by federal funds that comes to the city, transferred to us for stewardship that we administer uh, to the Parks Department. So it's used for economic development and other things. It's managed to a thing called the Consolidated Plan that you approve every five years and an action plan that's updated every year with multiple public meetings. Um, we just approved the last action plan in the spring of this year. Mel Alexander heads up this section for us. We just will recognize one of the top five community development enterprises by HUD in the, in the, in the, in the country. Would you, is yes, this $9 annual? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, and we also have an additional program income. So we, uh, for example, give out zero interest home loans to people of low income for home ownership. When they repay that, some of those funds come back into the program. Um, we, we don't account for that in this. I just show what we get on an annual basis from the feds. We get about another 600000 a year. Roughly, so we're just under 10 million this year for total program value. The rest of that's program income coming back. Over to real assistance, our voucher program. It's our largest dollar program, 52 million in budget authority. We have on the street right now 65 to 6,522 vouchers. The number of vouchers varies on a daily basis. We just opened our waiting list and uh, opened it and closed it last Friday. We had 10,300 as of this morning signed up uh, vouchers here in the community. Um, there's a preference for Metro, res Metro National residents. You can sign up from all over the country. These are portable vouchers. So we have vouchers in Whitefish, Montana, and Hawaii, and Alaska. Uh, most of those, though, right now are being placed uh, in the surrounding counties. So to get a voucher, you come in, sign up on the waiting list. Your turn comes. You come in, and we have a staff that does a pretty intrusive process of validating your income. We validate several things. We validate with the IRS, uh, with Treasury with Social Security, um, and we calculate what your earned income is by deducting things like child care, taxes, others. You have to be under 50% of the area median income to receive a voucher. And then once we determine what your, area, what your earned income is, you pay 30% of that earned income out of your pocket, and we give you a voucher worth uh, a federal wire transfer amount up to a thing called the fair market rent, a one-bedroom fair market rent, and right now, by HUD is established at $911. And so you're given that voucher. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that we may uh, provide a voucher, but they may move anywhere in the U.S. and utilize that voucher. Yep. So I would assume the reverse is we may have people living have in ports, they have vouchers port, We have ports military. in, right, but it's pretty uncommon in Davidson County because the national value of a voucher is insufficient to rent in Davidson County. 
that's our biggest problem. I was going to uh, I was gonna get that. Our, that's our central problem. We have a voucher value. We recruit landlords robustly. We have 1,100 in our landlord program here in Nashville. Most of those are return, uh, return people, and we give $1,000 for new landlords. If they sign up, we give them a $1,000 check to sign up in the program. But right now, if you look at the uh, Greater Nashville Apartment Association, I think a one bedroom is running about $1,425, and we're giving someone of low income a voucher that's worth about $9,11 to go out and find an apartment. So our placement rate is a real challenge for us. When I first got here in 2014, we would issue a voucher, and 94% of those would find an apartment within 60 days. Um, we're running about 58% right now. Wow. So that means for the same staff, I issue two vouchers to get one into play. Mr. Harper, is the, is the voucher a... Um, hey, okay, come on in. Commissioner Bowers, <laughs> my boss. <laughs> She can tell you all about vouchers. She uses them. <laughs> so, uh, is that an average, the 9-11? No, that's the benchmark. Okay. And, so, and the way the program works, you go out, and our, our sales pitch to the landlords is you've got the best tenant in the planet, and you've got the federal government as a guaranteed wire transfer. Mm -hmm. Most of our vouchers are people on minimum rents. A minimum rent's $25. So if you're under $18,000 on an annualized basis salary, you pay $25 bucks for your, out of your pocket and then the balance goes to the landlord. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what happens is the, the tenant that gets a voucher has to find a landlord. We give them a list. We have people that actually work this. They go out, they find the landlord. We're going to a three-way lease with the uh, landlord. We send out an inspection team to inspect the apartment. The apartment's inspected on an annualized basis. Um, the landlord uh, receives from the tenant what they can pay, and then we send them a wire transfer to their bank account, and we receive a budget authority to do that. So. We're just recognized as a, a, like the 20th year in a row as what's called a top performer, which means puts us in the top 5% in the country for managing these programs. Pretty proud of that because this economic environment to manage this program, make it work, is extraordinarily difficult right now. So our CMAP score is actually 100% on a 100% scale, which is kind of hard to achieve. It's measured largely on your about how much you use your about budget authority. Every year we slightly exceed our budget authority, and the federal government compensates us for the overage. So we try to target, and it's always a monthly balance, how many vouchers you have in play against the budget authority you have, so you slightly overspend, and you have enough in our cash reserves to cover if the feds don't bail us out on the 30th of September. And we just did this when we were about uh, 500000 over, and they gave us 500000 extra. So, so the voucher has a dollar limit. Yes, ma'am. It's a cap. So you cannot... I can adjust it up to 120% of the fair market rent with board permission. Right now we're at 100% because they just raised the benchmark about 60 days ago. We're trying to see where that balance is out in the market. Um, but the problem is the higher the dollar value of the voucher, the less number of vouchers you get to put in play. We've got to fix $52 million. Our vouchers right now kind of interestingly tend to tr are tend trending towards large families. Um, so if you issue a four-bedroom voucher, uh, which is $1,820 for a four-bedroom. And you put a bunch of four-bedrooms out in the market with $52 million, the number of vouchers you have in play decreases. So that, that's a balancing act. We do the math uh, every month. We review it, and there's a prediction tool that we use, and it's, a, it's an art and a science. So but uh, we're a topping program. You know, the part everybody knows about our bricks and mortar, affordable housing, 6,322 units. Most of those are apartments that were once in public housing, and now they transferred out. Next slide, uh, so I'm going to now focus on the bricks and mortar, um, which should be familiar to you. And I, I appreciate everybody staying awake, because I'm sure some of you have heard this many times. I'm Bob and, Bob and Brooke, they probably heard this 50 times and can probably recite the slides back to me. I, this, the next slide is just to give an example of where we are in apartment rent. So I, my benchmark rent, this is a two-bedroom. Um, so our, our two-bedroom um, vouchers are just over $1,000 right now. So I'm putting a thousand dollar voucher in the market where the average rent is six hundred dollars more, and we get we do get a, we do get landlords that take a haircut intentionally to stay in these programs, uh, and and we make sure that they're not slumlords by inspecting those. We have a pretty robust inspection routine. There's a federal checklist. We go and take pictures. We have to upload those to the accounts. So there's a, a, an inspection regime on top of that. Um, but on the bricks and mortar. Uh, so if those of you that know me have known me for a few years have heard this word rad. You're not hearing much of it anymore, uh, but I couldn't give a presentation about it. But there's a program called the Rental Assistance Demonstration. That would be a separate, if you really want to get into the housing geek stuff, presentation. But the point is, we are out of the public housing model of federally subsidized housing. There's none left in Nashville. In the process, though, we secured a 1,000 more apartments. 
that if we build them under the public housing model, we can get full new subsidies. And I'll get to why that matters in a moment. What it means in the RAD transfer is, under the public housing system, the federal government owns the land. Now your board in MDHA owns the land. And the way we're building now is we're borrowing money against our assets, money we have to pay back against the land, just like a big home equity loan, to build the apartments you see going up over at Casey. Um, so we've converted those. We have a 20-year contract that must be renewed at least one time. So it's a 40-year contract to run these apartments in a similar manner to public housing, but with a more generous subsidy. And that every year we get to increase the revenue we receive from the federal government by the rate of inflation. We have to apply for it, but it allows us to increase it. In public housing, you get no inflationary adjustment. You tend to get less money year over year. And you get no money at all for your capital needs. So what's happened with this program, we have stabilized the inventory of Nashville of all of our housing. HUD required us to create a $48 million capital needs reserve to fix roofs, big chillers, HVACs over the 20-year life of that contract. That money is in the bank. We came up with that money with reserve funds that the HUD gave us to create that account. And then each month, out of our profit and loss statement, out of our budget, we contribute a requisite amount to keep that account flush to address future big needs. And this isn't maintenance repair. This isn't, you know, the toilet broke and we have to replace a flapper. This is when the Parthenon Towers chillers go down, and it's a $400,000 replacement, which is planned life cycle replacement. Right up here, Lane's mechanical engineer. We've already set the money aside and predicted that through a third-party capital needs assessment by a third-party company that came in and did this over a two-year period. So if we do nothing else, we've stabilized our finances. We will increase 50 basis points over inflation with our revenues. We own the land, and we have a set-aside rainy day fund, more than that, a contingency fund called Reserve for Repair to fix things. Far more stable platform, preferred by HUD. Uh, we are the largest, uh, this city has the largest single uh, uh, RAD trans transaction in the country, and uh, the sector gets briefed on us pretty routinely. We get a lot of questions on it, what we're doing with the land. But that's sort of a big deal in Nashville, and we just finished our last conversion in March. So on to what we're trying to do. Once we knew we had the land, we're kind of the dog that caught the bus. So now what are you going to do with the land? Uh, we created a process based on a HUD process called Choice Neighborhoods where we go out to the community, we form a community advisory group. I know Colby's been to some of ours uh, for Edge Hill. Um, we get stakeholders in the community to participate with the planning of how we change, and we're focused on six old sites. Casey, everyone should be familiar with, built between 1937 and 1941. Sudicum Napier built roughly the same time frame, 38 to 45. Edge Hill Apartments finished in 61. Andrew Jackson and Cheatham were both built in the 30s, and Cumberland Ville View finished in 61. So we've got these six legacy properties. Now we have 22 sites. If you look at the previous page on the RAD conversions, there's a lot of properties on there. All the other sites are in great shape. All the towers were completely significant rehabs in the last five years. Does everybody know where John Henry Hale is in Charlotte? And that was a Hope Six. Now, Hope Six had some wrinkles, we could debate those, but the point is the resulting product is in great shape and does not need to be redone. These six sites and their land, uh, all of them are aging infrastructure underneath the property, aging infrastructure in the buildings themselves, and are long past shelf life. So our goal, you can say it's somewhat aspirational, it was based on analysis of two other programs that no longer are with us that we thought we were going to get financing for, is over time to master plan all six with the community, do this envision process of community meetings, charrettes, uh, working with the resident association, working with public meetings to come up with a master plan for each site and to redevelop concentrated poverty into mixed income. And what is mixed income for us? That's apartment A is someone of workforce housing, a cop, a firefighter, a policeman, a teacher, low income next door under subsidized rents with a contract on project-based rental assistance, and a part of the next apartment over is straight-up market rate. And that's a little bit, uh, not a lot of people are doing that. And we're doing that without displacing residents, and we're replacing all the low-income units that exist one for one, while we are adding about 10% more units of this thousand that we received from HUD of new subsidy to increase the affordable housing inventory. We've master plan Casey. It's under construction. It's an SP zoning. It has it does have a redevelopment district on it. 
Sudicum Navy just finished and the council approved that SP plan in roughly July. Uh, the first step the community wanted there was not construction. They wanted us to get the digital divide for all the school children bridged first. So on Friday, I handed out 39 laptops at Napier Elementary, along with uh, Principal Lawless. There's the first cohort of the over 1,000 school children that in our development budget, we parked 500,000 to buy them laptops. And they get two years of internet service. So that is because each of these plants has a people component, a neighborhood component, and housing. It's building a community. It's an intentional process. Um, so we hope to move to Sudicum Napier when our finance becomes uh, more clear on a couple of areas, and we can talk about that. Edge Hill is master plan with the community, as Kobe knows. It's in the planning process now for zoning. Once it's done, um, we can look at what's possible for the first step of construction and how to execute the plan. And then the other three, we hope to move to Cumberland View and start planning there next. Uh, we've got to work with the councilman. We have a new council. We need to talk to everybody. We don't have any finite plans for that yet, but we do have funding sufficient uh, to do the master plan. A master plan takes about two years with the community. There are a lot of voices out there. Edge Hill had a lot of voices. And you've got to listen to everybody. Um, but we, I tell people right front, we're not going to build uh, you know, Ferris wheels. We're not putting up the Eiffel Tower. You know, We're building mixed income, mixed use housing from concentrated property. How do you want to do it? And so that's sort of our vision of what we'll do across the city. We think it's transformational. You see the potential total number of units, all the one units that are low income get replaced one for one. Just to recap the objectives of one on slide six, increase the affordable housing stock in the city. So we say deeply affordable, that means federally subsidized new inventory, fully federally subsidized. Those are authorized for us. We have to build them before we can draw down the budget authority but it means we would increase the subsidized inventory that we manage in our bricks and mortar from 5,400 to roughly 6,500. That's our goal. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned that these are to be mixed mm -hmm. income places. So are there percentage goals? And does that mean that sure. you're going to hold so many units? Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes so, in that uh, they don't fit in what you need, then they would have to go on a waiting list until you... How, how will you handle that? Uh, if I understand the question, first of all, are there goals? Our goals are, are roughly 40% uh, of the original low income, 25% workforce, 35% market. Why is that? We found that financing these are challenging, and you can get breaks, meaning low income housing tax credits and preferred loans for the low income portion. The market rate pay for the apartments essentially themselves because you can set the market. Nobody gives you any help for workforce. It's just you got to put in more money at the front end, which is cash out of our bottom line, to buy down the debt so that you can make your mortgage payment with a lower rent that we, by choice, hold a lower value at 30% of the middle income of the city. Now, why do we do that? All the data we can find, and frankly, there's not as much out there as we would like, but purpose-built is a model for this in Atlanta. The lower ninth ward was rebuilt with a lot of federal money. Um, but what was discovered was if you don't have the workforce component, middle-income person, as sort of the adhesive to hold higher and lower incomes together, that you can have some real fracturing along income lines. Um, so that's one. And also, there's clearly a need in Nashville for workforce housing. I mean, I mean how many times? Well, I, I think the I'm, I'm totally <laughs> supportive of the ideas. I'm just wondering, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, you have Mrs. Brown come in and Mrs. Jones come in. And if they don't fit in the percentages of what you need, do they go on a waiting list till you get yes. those, or how, so, do, how will you handle so all that? So all the low income to replace one for one, they exist, they move in. Work for you, and, and to be frank, Kirkpatrick's our first one. We leased our last unit on Friday. Um, it took us uh, less than 30 days to lease up the workforce and market rate. Okay. But it's done the same way as everybody else does in the, in the community. We put out the market rate on social media. We put it on the website. We've got signs up. And it's first come, first serve off the waiting list. It okay. leads right off. So the demand is such and that the you're demand, not worried the about this. The demand in this city is such that we're not worried about the market rate or the workforce. Um, but if someone doesn't get in, it's like anywhere else. They can go on the waiting list and wait for one to open or for our new stuff to come online. Okay. So let me drive on. Do you see the objectives? I think that's familiar to us. But I want to emphasize we're keeping the residents in place. We're not disadvantaging residents. Um, we've moved just over 200 residents at Casey already. Um, 
and the moves go like this. We pay for everything to move them. Um, some people have had to move from old apartments into old apartments before they get a new one. And what we're doing, we haven't filled a vacancy off the waiting list at Casey in two years. So as natural vacancies occur, people get a higher job, they move and buy a habitat home. We have about 70 out of those 968 units that turn over each year. We've not filled them, so that creates individual onesies and twosies. And when it comes time to clear a block, we take those people that are there, and if we don't have a new apartment for them, we move them to an old apartment. We pay for their move, and we also give them a choice. They may take a voucher, or they may take a like apartment elsewhere in the inventory. And if they take a like apartment elsewhere, we give them uh, $200 a month for dislocation allowance for, to keep their kids in school. We've only had eight families take that option. But they were given a choice, stay at Casey and Old, go somewhere else, or take a voucher, and they chose us somewhere else. And I'm not sure some of them will move back because they seem pretty happy, but we knew there were going to be transportation issues to get their families to get their kids back to the same school, so they get 200 a month. Um, our amenities are critical of this. Uh, you probably saw a little bit of a teaser in the paper. At Casey, um, we did build a charter school. Um, at, that was the number one requested item on the, on the resident surveys. We do a resident needs survey across the population. That was their number one request. Uh, we are working and hope to work with you. We have uh, new market tax credits to build a library there. The library board and Ken Oliver are in close coordination on that. It obviously won't mature or go forward or have any discussions without having you deeply involved. But we're in the concept phase and we have investors that are interested in doing new market tax credits. That's a longer conversation to get through how that works. But that is the mechanism we use to build the school. It basically gives you a 25% discount in cash using tax credits, roughly. And that number can vary. The small, the, some of the costs are fixed. So the smaller the, pro, smaller the project, the less the percentage value of those credits because you have fixed costs for attorneys and surveys and other things that are roughly constant. We also are discussing with the Y the possibility of opening a new Y at Casey, where the YMCA will give 786 free memberships to low-income residents at Casey, um, which will allow us and have those families to have the opportunity to have their kids go to a great school and to have some fantastic after-hour work. So the meetings are important. And our real goal when we focus this lot is how do you change concentrated poverty through the housing platform? We think we're on at least in the right direction. Obviously, there's proof of concept, and Casey is our litmus test, uh, but thus far, it seems to be working well, although we're just getting started. So, update on where we are in Vision Casey. This sort of gives you the numbers. Um, I won't bore you with that too much, but uh, we're about $250 million under construction thus far to complete their finance. Mr. So, so. Yes, sir. Um, just uh, before we move off of Casey, I'm um, wondering if you could share with the committee some of what we talked about, um, about the idea that uh, going into Envision Casey uh, before the last election. There was um, multiple programs that would have gotten you guys the, the equity piece. And now without, with these change in federal programs over the last couple of years, just, you know, what we talked about giving some sense to the committee of absent contributions from Metro, the fact that we're looking at potentially decades to just get done with Casey. I, th I think I think we need to start socializing that concept. Thank you. So uh, you've probably heard me in public say multiple times, this is a marathon, not a sprint. That was intentional. When we did the assessment for the RADA conversions in 2014 and 15, there were three programs, these were Obama-era programs, that were available for cash equity. Now remember, we're borrowing money Okay, so when you borrow money, though, you have to have a cash contribution. In public housing model, you weren't allowed to keep cash. They took it away and gave it to another public housing agency, so you had to spend it. Um, so we don't have a big pot of money sitting around. But there was the first program was called Choice Neighborhood Implementation Grants. Those were $35 million a year. And on the Obama administration, they were set aside for RAD converting properties if you did a portfolio conversion. That was part of our logic. We'll convert. We'll have the set aside, 35 million, which we can leverage to 70 to 100 on an annualized basis. That was lane one. This administration has chosen uh, to zero that program out, except for the public housing portion. So that door closed, okay? And now we were prohibited from applying because we're a RAG converted property. So we went the exact opposite of what we intended. Change the administration. 
and I would say this administration has been pretty forthright about being uh, wanting to be fiscally conservative on social programs, uh, including housing. They've zeroed out community development programs, all of them every year in their budget, and the Senate and the, and the House have restored it. Um, and we've had to go to D.C. We've been part of that team every year for three years and lobby, lobby, lobby to get it put back in, as an example. That was change one. Uh, change two was a program called Moving to Work, in which, again, there was a rad set aside for portfolio conversions. <laughs> so we thought the logic was sound, and it was in the Obama administration. And that would allow you to take a slice of your vouchers, up to 20%, and HUD would match. So if you took 20% of your voucher money and put it against new construction, HUD would match those funds, and you could double your funds. So roughly 50 million, we could take 10, match 10, could have 20. That would mean we have to dial our vouchers back, but the payoff would be over a period of time, we'd build back the other stuff. So we had 20 and 35 for a $55 million stake. And our third lane was low-income housing tax credits, which the Tennessee Housing Development Agency has been wonderful, and we received five 9% awards in a row which has worked out to be about $10 million. So our original assessments were $35 million CNI, Choice Neighborhood Implementation, uh, $20 million in MTW, and $10 million in low-income housing tax credits for $65 million in cash. Once we finished RAD conversion, put in to build with. We wound up getting 10 per year. Now, what does that mean? That means it's going to take us a lot longer to do what we originally planned. How long? I don't know exactly. We think at Casey, it's probably over 20, as you asked me, <laughs> It's probably about 2032 right now. Well, it sits on tape, but that, it's a long time. And what we found a couple other add-ons. We did not as accurately with our engineers estimate the cost of the aging infrastructure under Casey. As an example, the sewer pipes there, storm and sanitary run in one pipe. Because it was federal land, the EPA decree for the city to separate them, you could get a pass on. Now the federal government doesn't own it anymore and we have to do the federal, we have to separate both those. We're paying for all that. We had to upgrade the uh, electric substation for the entire basin on the East Nashville side. I don't remember the exact figures, but it's roughly uh, 8 kVA to like 22 kVA. We had to pay for that infrastructure out of our pocket. I'm not complaining about that, but those were costs that were not in the original figures. So between the additional infrastructure costs, which we are paying the majority of those out of cash, or the credits, and the loss of the two largest funding streams for equity that we did bank on, statements I made in 14, 15 that I thought we could do it in a certain period of time, and that we looked pretty good for pulling this off, which people are probably rightfully calling me out on now, uh, those fundamental uh, assumptions that were based in existing notices from HUD have changed. And I'm not complaining about that. We're going to drive on and keep doing everything we can with every resource we have. But help from the city would be would, would move this program along. And I can't tell you how fast, and but that'd be something we could all work on together. Is that is that what you, sort yeah, of what you? Would, if I just may real quick, because I want to hit that next meeting next door. Um, uh, Council Lady Allen. So I, I wanted to make sure that we talked about that because mm -hmm. there there has been. A disconnect, which um, I appreciate, Mr. Harbison connecting the dots between what the public statements were five-ish years ago to um, all of a sudden in the spring there was oh let's have the city spend you know hundreds of millions of dollars on it and and the connecting the dots of um, a loss of federal programs, loss of 55 million dollars a year potentially um, in equity, which could be leveraged to be twice that. Um, like the thing that we have to absorb as a committee, as a council, and as a city is the to finish envision Casey, the residential units. He just said 2032. Um, if if MDHA is left to their own devices, based on today's profitability, assuming the federal government doesn't change its programs again, um, and assuming no help from Metro, and that's one of the six. And one of the things I think the like we talk, my personal opinion, when we talk about affordable housing going forward, like all the Barnes funding, all everything else notwithstanding, if we're saying our um, 80, 60 to 80 year old uh, low income housing stock can't be replaced um, uh, in anything under 
decades and decades and decades um, because of federal programs without Metro um, being involved. I think that's a sea change from the way we've been thinking about affordable housing for the last four years at mm -hmm. least. And I appreciate uh, Mr. Harbison putting the fine point on, on those numbers. So. Yeah, I just it was an honest assessment, guys. I, would try, I really thought we were going to be a lot closer. And if you look at look at our master plan on the uh, website, which is done in 14, it said conservatively 12 years starting in 2013. So no, 2014, I think. It was based on those those basic assumptions. But thank you. Um, uh, and I just reassure you, we're going to do everything we can with everything we have. Um, but help and until we maybe have that conversation, how fast can we make it? What can we do? Um, and I think right now what I would say is we're going to continue to plan so we have the other three. And I had this conversation, I think, with you or maybe Aoli. Um, you know, we don't, you can't predict the future. So the future with, and I'll just be speculative, <laughs> dangerous when you're on tape. Future with a President Warren, a Speaker of the House Maxine Waters, and a President Pro Tem of Cory Booker looks really different than the fabric today. Now that's just the reality of life, and that, that may be an extreme example, but we want to be ready with plans in place that if the federal money suddenly does come up, we can go right forward and say, look, we plan Cumberland View, and the community supports it. And we have proof of concept right here at Casey that this will work. I've got a strong case I can take to D.C., but right now, those opportunities are, are increasingly limited. So, um, it's a thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Just to go on the things we have done, so it's not like it's all gloom and doom. Uh, the Patrick Park uh, is our first test case. 36 of the very low income, uh, which are original residents of Casey that transferred into new housing. 20 are workforce and 38 market rate, and just as an anecdote, I helped move in a physician's assistant or lawyer husband and their six-year-old kid right next door to a low-income mother with three boys about a month ago. And I came out about three weeks ago when I was taking Paulette around, and the, the young lads were out kicking the soccer ball around. Together. I mean, that's what we hope to achieve. So just that picture, I think, and, and uh, we were worried that people would judge each other by the size of their wallets. And it seems to thus far going very well. Now, we've intentionally hired a community engagement manager for this process. We had our Kirkpatrick Fall Festival. We have social events to bring the community together. And if you haven't seen the product, please come look. That is an A, that is an a plus property. Mm -hmm. And all the apartments are the same. The low income apartment, and we don't even talk about who's low income. We found as we looked into this, the last thing we want to do is even say that. Mm -hmm. These just have any people who rent there. And everybody's paying the same rent. Just might happen, this nice lady over here has a very generous uncle called Sam that helps her out. And this teacher right here has somebody called MDHA in the state that gave, gave her a little help along the way. Uh, if somebody ever asked, but we, we don't want people to know. But that's going really well. Um, we have a bunch more over there. You see them coming out of the round box, but one, two, three, uh, 3A. Uh, we're working with the Y to bring the Y there. We're working to bring a great library, which we think will help with the capital spending plan and keep your costs down. Uh, working with that, Kent, well, that's a separate presentation to bring the amenities, but we think we can change that community. And we're seeing great progress. I will get to those slides. But I want to talk about, before we run out of time, uh, the next investment. Randy Rogers, does everybody know where Germantown is? The Kroger, right there. You have the Kroger on Germantown, right across the Wortham Bag. That's our old shop site. Uh, we have, with the previous administration, this is from Last year or two years ago, capital spending plan. 2018 plus. capital spending plan. 18 <clears throat> spending plan, $25 million is going in here. Now, it's not all $25 million is going to this place. It's going, uh, some going to townhomes at Casey. But this is a national demonstration project with HUD to bring in 50. Of the, remember I told you we have 1,000 new subsidies. This will bring 50 new subsidized low-income units into the national inventory in a mixed-income environment and then immediately upon occupancy be transferred from federal ownership to NDHA ownership under the RAD program. Now, you have to be a housing geek to get excited about that, but that's unusual, and if we can make this process work, it'll be a model for us in the future. But the point is there we're going to increase workforce, low income, and a mixed income environment, and market rate at one site, mm -hmm. and your funds from your predecessors are the key to the equity and the cash. We have a 4% uh, low income housing tax credit uh, and a bond and conventional bank loan will finance it. I don't know the one that Judith is here for that uh, we offer, although this is not one 
this is sort of an offer, but uh, we've been discussing this for about six months, maybe or so. Um, so again, we have this inventory of full subsidy. You are building permanent supportive housing. If you desire, and we think it's wise, rather than have the Metro budget carry the maintenance, repair, and funding for these apartments, we, re we recommend that we bring this into the inventory of the new subsidy. So we take 100 of our new subsidies, put it into this building, but it has to be done under the public housing rules, which means MDHA has to own the building. So we would own it, we would manage it, but we pay for the water and the lights, we pay for the apartments, and we have to manage it under the federal rules, which may have some wrinkles that we have to work around. But conceptually, that will save the city the cost of maintenance, repair, et cetera, okay? The uh, administrative, yes, sir. I, I saw this is in the capital spending plan. Do you know offhand which year that was included? In the uh, 2017 17, capital spending plan. Dollars. 17 money. Right. So that's fiscal 17. Mm -hmm. It was approved uh, in, I think, October, November of 2017. Thank so it would have been you. fiscal 18. Gotcha. gotcha. So, and I, I should have said that as well. The Randy Rogers money was in October 19, or uh, October of 2018 capital spending plan. I guess would have been fiscal 19, obviously. So Metro pays to build, then turn ownership to MDHA, and then MDHA takes control of the maintenance and yearly whatever needs to be done with the federal laws on a go forward basis. Exactly. And then would there be a clause to revert back to Metro yeah. if? Is yeah, it no the longer federal government that. would allow it. So the, for, the only reason you want us is to get the federal money, right? So the federal money right now is not in anybody's pocket in Davidson County. Mm -hmm. So you transfer it to us. We apply it to the HUD to put, you put in a thing called the Public Housing Inventory Control System, and then the appropriation process. They give us a per unit value, roughly eight hundred dollars per unit. Price six seventy five. Probably 675. 675, okay. Uh, so this is what we did. If you know where George Barrett Manor is, the case of the new buildings we have there, this is what we did there. We built it with cash. We brought in the public housing inventory, and that's where we got 675 in the apartment. Um, and then once we had it, we moved it into the RAD program. And all that's kind of housing geek stuff, but there are two things that have to happen. One, we have one of our construction members sitting in as a, a sort of an advisor to make sure it meets the federal standards. For construction, which I, we're confident it will, and then we have to get HUD to say yes. But HUD is tentatively at the regional level said this would be acceptable, and they would give us full subsidy. But the only way you can get the housing subsidy from the HUD, it has to come to your housing authority. That's just the law. Mm -hmm. So the subsidy is like a project-based voucher. So it is a project-based voucher. The subsidy. Uh, it's a reason it's public housing, and then we transfer it to project-based real assistance. And so then you we, transfer it to that. We, we got to do it through the rent process to do that. Right. right. But that's all doable. And, and, uh, and I know this is Housing Geek 101, but we were Randy and Randy Rogers would bring in the public housing inventory and simultaneously work on the staff work to do the RAD conversion. That's what we do here. We get it set to go in the public housing inventory. You know Tasha, right? Mm -hmm. she'll, she'll approve it. And at the same time, I'm working in Atlanta for the RAD conversion with Denise, and you've met. And then Tasha approves the public housing. We put the first resident in. The next week, it converts over. We get you know, we get clear title of land and a four year contract. And, and so that's still right in discussion to decide whether that's well, it, it, well, now, what's not in discussion is the money's appropriate. You're going to build it, right? What's in discussion is what do you do? How do you operate? How do you how do you do the operating stuff? We would recommend you take in the federal money, but if that's not going to fit, okay. I mean, we can certainly step back. Uh, just on public-private partnerships over at Curb Victory Hall, uh, we're really proud of this. This has got, actually, Tony Giantana is the developer. Uh, Mr. Curb gave us $500,000. The city, the state of Tennessee gave us a 9% loan housing tax credit. This is new units for homeless vets, 37 uh, for veterans experienced homes coming through. OSD is a supportive, uh, they'll be the uh, provider of wraparound services. Uh, we're funding it, we're going to run it, and Tony is doing the development and building. Uh, Tony threw his developer fee in free. Tennessee Housing, Task, Tennessee Housing uh, Trust Fund gave us 500000 and we've got a small loan that was paid by the, about, by the values of the, of the Veterans Administration Board of Housing Vouchers. Can you give uh, this one? Uh, yeah. You know where Edge Hill is? Mm -hmm. uh, you know right there where Operation Stand Down is? Oh, mm -hmm. right. Right, right there at the south. corner? Oh, 
no south, and there's, you'll see the construction uh, skirts are up us on their parking lot. Um, and then we'll invite everyone to come to the opening of Bordeaux Homes. Uh, this is on the old, uh, North, uh, Nashville, County, Nashville Hospital County uh, land up in Bordeaux. 40 townhomes, this is uh, the last of the flood money from 2010, which I, when I got here was about to be recaptured by HUD because we hadn't built any housing. The only flood impacted area that we could find the land and the city gave us the land. Uh, we used that money there to build 40 new townhomes. This is all workforce housing. It'll be pegged at 30% of median income costs. And we should have the ribbon cutting on the 19th of yes, November. Sir. You say 30? 30% 30 really? of median income right. is the pegged rent. Okay, gotcha. No, that's no. the pegged 30% of the 30 income. 30% of income. It's actually going to be gotcha. sort of for folks making around 80% 80, 80 80, 80 of AMI. Gotcha. But 30% of their income. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm rent. sorry. Yeah, we go. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Midpoint of AMI, 30% down to 80%. That was the range. And I, I, I can get those rents for you. So, um, to Mr. Mendez's point, you know, a vision of our resources is delusion. Uh, one of the main challenges or advantages of RED is it forces you to run a business. So now we have a method to grow our gross revenue year over year through contract increases with the uh, inflation, adjusted inflation adjusted increases. We've become ruthless and businesslike on our operating expenses. We generate net operating income. We track our fixed expenses uh, for largely debt service and we have a cash flow. That cash flow every year goes right back into Envision projects. That's where the $500,000 comes from for the laptops. That's where the cash comes from to close these LIHTC uh, and other loans that we're doing. Uh, Metro Investment, we talked about Randy Rogers and previous capital spending plans. We would hope to open that conversation with you about the future to Mr. Mendez's point where we were banking on more generous federal funds from a previous administration. This administration has a different view and um, those funds just aren't there. So we hope that you would see the wisdom maybe of us working together on it. If not, we can do everything we can. Low income housing tax credits is our bread and butter um, and the community investment tax credit on the Community Reinvestment Act. Basically what we get uh, for our low income housing, we get four percentage points below prime for our, our loans. So a lot of our loans are at zero percent, um, which is a THDA product. Uh, we also use uh, multifamily tax exempt bonds, FHA loans, bank loans, so pretty much any toolkit of financing we've explored and used in the last five years aggressively. And we, we, each project's a little bit different. We tailor the resources available with the best loan we can on each package. And each one of them has a little bit different wrinkle. Some have heavy 9%, some are four, some are bond issuances. They do it side by side. Um, we went into this, and one of our goals, one of my stated goals was, I know we say we have a goal of 20% diversified business, but in my experience, we don't really do much on minority business. And those are kind of different, but they're the same. So what I'm really kind of happy with, and I thought I'd throw this slide in, is that over the period of time that we've increased our actual um, construction significantly, uh, we've also maintained, uh, or not maintained, we've grown our, our minority business enterprise awards. So we're tracking, um, thus far for a total DB about 35%, but our minority business at about 12 and we're going to 20. So that's one of our, our objectives as we move through again about community building. And then when it comes to budget time, uh, we are your best customer for the operating budget <laughs> and that we send you money. <laughs> and uh, you don't send us any, that's basically what this slide means. Uh, we do spend a lot of money on additional policing and then you'll see the results said in my final slide. So. We uh, pay for a task force of officers who work directly for MDHA to focus only on the housing sites, and we have memorandums of agreement with Hermitage, uh, I'm sorry, Hermitage North Precinct and uh, East Precinct for uh, $200,000 for North for Hermitage and $150,000 each to pay overtime to get walking patrols and community and policing. So the only rule that I I haven't used my terms, and I just met with a recent captains this week, I said, I don't want you playing gotcha, I want you to play get to know the people. So we really get a lot of pay off this. The officers escort kids when they get off the bus, take them home, they shoot hoops with them, and we're seeing a real payoff in information coming from the community of the officers to prevent crime, not to catch the bad guy after the crime occurs. Is that, is that a change? I mean, is that something that y'all have implemented? In the last, I've put together in the last 18 months. 18 yeah. months, that's good. Uh, East Precinct pioneered the way for us, and we saw such a drop. Souk and Napier's been our real worry. 
Um, we did get the long guns out. I mean, I, if anybody knows my background, I have some experience with some of this. Not, I'm not a long pistol guy, but you know, long guns on a sight drives me crazy. So I'm not happy with pistols either, but I mean, long guns change the whole dynamic. We've gotten them out of Sidicum Napier, but it's mainly by aggressive policing with the community engagement team. Mm -hmm. And the difference is, you know, who trusts an officer if you don't know them, right? Because all you see is media, or you see them doing what they have to do when they do an arrest. That's not pretty. <laughs> don't make you want to talk to them. And that's the only environment. You never learn anything about your own police force. We've got a great police force. Um, so, uh, and talking to the officers, it's a very popular program for them. This is their favorite overtime, they tell me. Now, whether they just tell me that because they want me to keep funding it, I don't know. But, I mean, it is popular with the officers. It seems to be working. It's worked greatly at East Precinct. Really, really been great. And we're seeing an impact. Uh, Hermitage is just getting started. I'm sorry, North Precinct is just getting started. So we've got uh, Cumberland View, Andrew Jackson, and Cheatham. All are not nearly as bad as Casey was four years ago, but they've got their issues. And they'll start with their uh, their overtime program here. Uh, well, basically now we just met with the cat police captain last week. So with that, just some numbers uh, of what's happening at Casey. Um, overall crime down 36 percent over the last three years. Uh, the violent crimes, the key one, we cut it just about in half. And our homicides. Uh, you know, it's a horrible thing to when you're trying to provide a place for people to live that's safe and affordable to measure your success by the number of people killed. That's not a very good metric, but it is one that we've made great, great work on. So went a little bit long. Uh, appreciate your questions, and Matt and I are here to answer any other questions you might have. That's just sort of a starter, and happy to come back anytime you want to see us. And if this you've got is, any questions, you can't great. get a hold of me, get a hold of Matt. So. Very, very helpful. So just, uh, just for context, and then I'll open up for questions. Um, you know, we, our job is, is to pass laws, and so what I'm trying to help us learn is in the spectrum of, you know, very, very low affordable housing and workforce and all that, who does what? And y'all obviously are doing everything well at this point. I mean, you're covering the spectrum, but you uniquely are the best at the, the low income housing. And so our, my question to you is, you know, what else, what else do you need from us? You've, you've talked about the need for maybe Metro to help with infrastructure costs. What else can we be doing to help you do well, your I think job? the greatest opportunity for us to make a dent is building out the thousand, it's called fair cloth amendments. So if you Google that, you'll see what the what the rule is. It, well, basically, we went from being capped at 5,400. I got a guarantee that we can go up to 6,500 of subsidized apartments. So, like we hope to demonstrate at Randy Rogers, and that to me is the test case. If we can do that at Randy Rogers, that's where Metro could really help in a similar vein by providing cash sufficient for us to close at 4%. We can get 4% Litex. They're unlimited. They're not competitive. I can get the 4% of the bond deal. I can get that going down, going up. 9% are competitive. And we've won those five times. We lost this year for the first time in five years, mainly because everybody in the state's copying us. Ben Bentley, who used to be my chief operating officer, is executive director at Knoxville. He's doing a rad conversion. Now he competes with us. You know, uh, Richard McLean in Johnson City, they're all... I and mean, I'm not complaining, it's just where we were the only guy in the state compete for these. Now, we're, now we got real competition. But that would be an area that we could come to you with proposals for how we start drawing down that thousand. And frankly, what's happened in the country, since public housing is so woefully underfunded, you've gone from an inventory with a budget, an inventory and budget authority of 1.5 million apartments to 1.2. So I could get even more of these if I can demonstrate. The HUD loves this. If we can demonstrate that we can build in a mixed income environment, I think we can go beyond the thousand, but we, we should try to get after that because that's really the only way you can get someone that has truly affordable housing. They pay only 30% of their earned income. Most of them pay 25 to 100 bucks, and we get a federal transfer to pay for the rest of business. And There's only one place jobs. to get that. There's only, I mean, unless Metro has a magic pot of money to do it themselves, there's only one place to get it, and once we lock it in our rent, it's a 40-year run. It's statutory. It can't be messed with. The problem with public housing is it's an, annual, it's an annual contract. It's called the annual contribution contract. It's only renewed on an annualized basis. That's what all the dust up was that Kay can give you, because the Trump administration sought to cancel all the public housing contracts last budget cycle. They were just gonna get out. Now, you, you can have a policy debate on that, but if you're not focused on this, it's not a part of your core policy. 
you just jettisoned it. And it was a fight, and they, the, the fight against them won, and it was restored. We're not in that mode anymore. So that would be my case to you. I think there's a real opportunity. That's great. Yes, sir. That's over. Um, if the permanent supportive housing were um, put under MDHA ownership, would those units count against our fair cloth cap? Uh, yes. The answer yes. is probably. Okay. I mean, so there's some wrinkles there. One would be, you're talking about the part of permanent supportive housing from Judith. The, um, for the, the homeless site. Yes. For the homeless Yes, shelter. absolutely. I thought you meant in general if we had a permanent supportive <laughs> housing homeless policy and we're building to it. But yes, this would absolutely count as a fair cloth. But, so. but on, only if it were in the case that it was under MDHA. Correct. So. It has to be under MDHA. And, we have to, and the wrinkle you've got to come to grips is we have to own the building. Yeah. Um, so we could, we could actually do a ground lease on the land if you wanted to, um, but we'd have to own the building. And I don't know if the reversionary clause, which I understand why you do it, we'd have to get how to accept that. I'm not sure they would, because they look at it as an indefinite public subsidy. They want to have the insurance that they've got the building. Mm -hmm. So. <clears throat> and those would be for what we call in the industry extremely low income yes. individuals, below 30% and below. That's the extremely low category. Well, they'll be homeless, so yeah. you know, they're going to they're gonna be a minimum rent. So they're going to be at 25 bucks, and we have nonprofits that can help us pay that if we can't get any other way. So. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it has to be on by us, and it has to be on us, and we'll count against the fair cloth. Thank you. Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, do we... Is, is that a real problem, or or is that other 900 going to get built so fast that we'll regret? I that can't build that fast without your help. Okay. Just can't. Gotcha. So resources. that may be a good use of 10% of that fair cloth cap. Other questions, thoughts, whatever? We know where to find these guys. Um, we, we appreciate y'all educating us. I, I, just, I just want us to become equipped um, to eventually you know, bring forth some legislation that will move the needle and anything else we can do to support you. We hope y'all will. We'll continue to right. I'd like to come back after we work with Kent on the library. Um, okay. the, East, the East Library, if you know where it is, the old Carnegie Library across from East, it's, oh, yeah. it's tiny, it's, it's, it's virtually useless, yeah. and Brett can give you chapter and verse on it. Right. We have a very good plan to re recapitalize that as a computer site and a learning site and build a gorgeous new library on Casey with new market tax credits. And does that fit the Carnegie requirement to... Keep it. Fits every every requirement, and uh, Gobble Hayes, our architect, We've already got a contractor, and I've got new market tax credit investors to put the uh, funding up there. It, it's a separate briefing on how you use new market tax credits, but basically, we would build it using the new market tax credits, own it, you would lease it from us to the seven year tax credit compliance period, and then buy us out, and we pass on the value of the tax credits to you. So you get a brand new building at a 25% discount, basically. That's the that's the hook. Now, there's a lot of details behind all that, but we'd have to be the ones receiving and managing the tax credits with our tax credit investors in a limited partnership, general partnership like LIHTC. Gotcha. And then, and then at the end of the tax credit compliance, when it's done, everybody's out, you're building and you buy us out. So that, that, and that way we get a new library, five, six years, set thing. Then go against your capital spending plan. You're kicking the capital spending plan down the road. We, right. But we need, we need a binding agreement before we enter into the New market tax credit deals with the investors. That's All right. way ahead. Let me know when you're ready to come back on that one. That was good. Any See, other? When's the next meeting? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> two weeks. So John's got that one. Okay, so we, we will meet in two weeks, whether we have legislation or not, just because I'm, I'm, I'm all about education. So I hope that is working for people. Let me have up the schedule. With that, I will adjourn. If y'all want to stick around and ask questions individually, thank y'all so much for coming. Thanks. Thanks.